Okay, we're now recording. So a couple things. Um, I really am not going to enjoy this if I'm just talking to an empty, silent crowd. So I'm going to ask questions and I want people to answer, even if three of you unmute and answer at the same time. That's fine. Also, you are welcome to turn on your camera because that also gives me a little bit of feedback when I can see people's faces. I can only see four people at a time, but I will have feedback from those four people. Um, and then the other thing is, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, we're probably going to be moving quicker than we normally would in a review anyway, because of just of how this is working. So um, what was I going to say? No, can't remember. Okay, so uh, test opens on Monday. And well, actually, I do have one question for you. Um, because I can't see it. Have, have people been finding where they're posting the exploratory lab videos on Learning Suite? Because I don't have access to them. And so I'm curious because people have turned in their labs and I don't know where the videos are. I think it's just under the schedule part. Really? I've actually, I found it somewhere else. So I've been told that they're on like the communities tab. Yeah, so if you just go to like on Learning Suite, all courses, uh -huh. like that first tab, and then there's a some tab that no one ever clicks on, but it says communities. You click on that, and there's a link that says exploratory lab, um, like videos or something, and it has all the information on there. Okay, cool. So I will just tell my students that and yeah, tell them that tab. Haley said so. Um, sweet. And also, I guess they explained it in your email. So, okay. Um, any questions about the tests in particular? I guess I don't really have any answers to your questions. You'll probably get more from your professors, um, but it opens on Monday um, and it's going to be online. So there we go. And um, so I know you said you are recording it. Um, yeah. Are you just going to email out like a link to get to the recording? Yeah. So you guys, did you guys all get an email from that had like all of the reviews on a spreadsheet? Yeah, like the Google Doc. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick the link on there, but also I'm going to put it, I'm, I'm just going to post it onto my um, YouTube channel. Oh, so cool. I don't know if people know my YouTube channel, but I will post it in, oh, did that even work? I'll post it in the chat right now. Oh, why is this not working? Um, well, I'll post it in the chat sometime. And then that YouTube channel also has, um, I can do it right now also has videos of the problem sets. This test covers problem sets 23 through 31. Here we go. And that's now in the chat. So um, that's got videos of me going through all the problem sets and talking through all the problems. So hopefully that's helpful to some of you. Um, any other questions before we just get going? I have a question. Uh huh. So on the last test we had to know the like the polyatomics and stuff mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that stuff we're still gonna have to know for this exam just because i realized that i had like forgotten all the polyatomics that i'd memorized yeah so it'd probably be a good idea to review them because we could it's fair game for us to just say like potassium chlorate and you need to be able to know what that is okay. now it's multiple choice right so so you'll have to be able to identify it on site not have to write it out of nowhere does that make sense yeah so That'll help a little bit, I guess. Okay, but cool. Thanks. I wouldn't expect a lot of it. It's just you never know which one they're going to put on there. So, cool. Is the whole exam going to be multiple choice then? Yes. That's my understanding. Do you know if it's going to be through Proctorio or on the learning suite? I haven't heard any confirmation about that yet. Has anybody else heard? Learning suite. That's what you heard? Okay. I'm sure that we'll get more information. Um, at the end of the day, wherever it is, you're going to take it and it's going to be fine. Um, but, okay. Anything else? All right. In that case, um, if you've been to a review of mine before, you know how this works. I'm just going to be um, working through the problems. If you're in Aspen's class, I emailed out the problems. If not, you'll see them because they'll be on my screen. So I'm just going to go ahead and share um, my screen. And you're going to be able to look at my ceiling while I do this. Oh, come on. Maybe. Hmm. 
Man, sometimes it doesn't want to work. Sorry, I know this is crazy. I'm just sometimes when I try and share my screen, the screen that I actually want to share doesn't pop up. Oh, man. Sorry, guys, I don't know why this isn't working. I literally do it all the time. There it is, okay. There you go, now you can see my OneNote? Yes. Sweet, thanks, Haiti. Haiti's my go-to answer my rhetorical questions student, so. All right, um, so we're just gonna get started. Um, so we started off the, the unit talking about gases, specifically talking about ideal gases, and so we made five assumptions that allowed us to treat gases as being ideal. Um, anybody know what those are? Or at least just give me one of them. Doesn't take up any volume. Yep. The volume of the particles is pretty much zero because they take up so much space that the actual like the actual protons, electrons, neutrons don't really take up any space. Uh, isn't it that the particles don't lose any kinetic energy when they bounce off each other? Yeah, and we call that elastic collisions. Okay, so that means like billiard balls, when, when two balls hit each other, they just bounce off each other. They don't slow down at all. That's how we treat ideal gases. Um, the temperature is zero degrees Celsius? Uh, not quite. So that's, for, that's, that's the standard temperature um, of gases, but that's not an assumption of ideal gases. Okay. Um, there is one related to temperature, though, and that's that the temperature is just proportional to the kinetic energy. In other words, when you heat up a gas, all it does is move faster. Another one is like, um, there's like no intermolecular like connections or whatever. Yep, no intermolecular forces, which helps with these elastic collisions, right? Because what that means is when particle one goes and hits particle two, right, they don't stick to each other at all. They just bounce right off, okay, because there's no intermolecular attractions. Okay, and any more? What's the last one? Let's see if I can remember the last one. Oh, this one's dumb. We say they have constant random motion. Okay, so we make these assumptions, and when we make these assumptions, we can say that a gas is behaving ideally, um, and that allows us to do calculations in a simplified way. Um, it's kind of like in physics when we talk about having uh, frictionless surfaces, right? It makes our calculations easier. But in chemistry, a lot of times our gases do behave um, pretty ideally. And so they're fine assumptions to make. But when do these assumptions not work? There's a couple of conditions that we talked about, I think, um, when these assumptions break down. Very low temperature. Low temperature. Awesome. I heard it. So uh, very low temperature and very high pressure. Okay, what happens at a low temperature that makes these assumptions break down? They slow down. They move closer. Yeah, so they slow down, and, and what does that affect in terms of the assumptions? It gives them more time to make a connection and have more intermolecular force. Yeah, when, they, when the gas particles are moving slower past each other, they're more likely to, let me think of it, put it this way, this guy's moving this direction, and he's more likely to feel attracted to that one if he's moving slower. Does that make sense? Whereas no intermolecular forces, they would just shoot right by. Okay, so um, low temperature will increase your intermolecular forces. What happens when you have a high pressure? Volume um, depends on work. Yep, yep. Um, so when you have a high pressure, you're taking all of these particles, and you're squeezing them close together, even though they're still gases. Okay, and when you squeeze them that close together, all of a sudden the volume of the particles starts to matter. Okay. And so um, usually we talk about temperature affecting the intermolecular forces. 
and pressure affecting the volume. Um, and we'll see more of that uh, as we move down to talk about Van der Waals. Okay, any questions about that stuff? All right, we're just gonna keep going. If you guys don't stop me, I'm just full steam ahead. All right, what is the root mean square speed of CO2 at 150 degrees Fahrenheit? Okay, so there is an equation on your equation sheet for root mean square speed. Um, so I would recommend that you guys pull up your equation sheet um, while we're doing this, if you haven't already, as well as a periodic table. Because I, I can pull them up, but I have to switch between screens and it just becomes complicated. So the equation for root mean square speed of a gas is, it's got that little U RMS, is 3RT over M. Okay, so let's talk about each of these. Uh, what is M? Molar mass, isn't it? It is, right? And do you remember what units you're supposed to use? Kilograms. Yep, in this equation, it's kilograms. Okay. Uh, temperature is obviously temperature, right? And what are the units for that? Kelvin. Kelvin. And then R is the ideal gas constant. And which, which ideal gas constant do we use in this equation? A point three one four. That's right. And this is the only time um, that we use eight point three one four is in this equation. And the reason is just because the units we want joules per mole Kelvin. Um, and I could break down the units more, but it's okay to just remember for the root mean square speed, you're using 8.314. Okay, so if I want to now do this, um, let's do it. So I'm trying to find the root mean square speed. I've got three, I've got my 8.314. Temperature, this is in Fahrenheit. I don't know why I did that. Um, so on your equation sheet, it shows you how to switch from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So you've got to take your Fahrenheit and subtract 32 and then multiply by five over nine. And that gives you Celsius. I do that and I get 65.55 degrees Celsius. And then I want to get that to Kelvin. So I add 273 and I get 338.55. Does that seem correct? Anybody else getting that? Maybe I did that yes. wrong. That is what you're getting? I got that. Okay, cool. I just did it wrong the first time I did it. 150 minus 32 times 5 over 9 plus 273. Yep, okay. I don't know why I did it wrong the first time. Anyway, so we've got 338.6 is my temperature in Kelvin. And then... Uh, my molar mass of CO2 in kilograms is 0 0.044. Okay, I'm going to just plug all that in. And I got four, no, not square root. I got 438, and the units will end up as meters per second. Confirmation? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. So that's what it means. Go ahead. How did you get the 0 0.044 again? So that's the molar mass of CO2. So it's a carbon plus two oxygens. That gives me 44. The problem is I want it in kilograms. Oh, okay. So, the kilograms. Yep. yep okay, that's got why. it. Thanks. So just so everybody, oh, just so everybody knows, every once in a while, a, a, I get a notification on my screen that my internet connection is bad, and I and I've been told that I go silent when that happens. And so, if you ever just hear me stop talking for like five seconds, I'm just waiting for that notification to go away. But okay, so, question. yeah, yeah, the units on the R is, is joules per mole Kelvin. Is that yeah. What that is? Do you want me to show you how those units turn into meters per second? Yeah. Okay. Let me give me some space. So if you look at your equation sheet. Uh, so the units are 
joules per mole Kelvin. That's for R. But if you look at your equation sheet um, under energy, it tells you a joule is equal to a kilogram meters squared per second squared. Okay, so this is the same as joules per mole Kelvin. And then I multiply by temperature, so my Kelvin goes on top, and I divide by the molar mass, and I do the molar mass in kilograms. Let me write this better. I do the molar mass, this is kilograms per mole. So the mole goes to the top, I get kilograms per mole, which means Kelvin cancels, mole cancels, kilogram cancels, meters squared per second squared, but then I take the square root of it, right? So I get meters per second. And that's why we need to use kilograms as our mass because joules is, has kilograms in it. Otherwise, we'd end up off by a thousand. Okay, so just so people know, I'm not monitoring the chat. And so if people ask stuff on the chat that you think is an actual question they want to ask and they're just too shy to turn on their microphone, somebody who's not shy, go ahead and ask the question. That's all right with you guys. All right, so let's talk about diffusion and effusion. What is diffusion? Movement from a high concentration to a low concentration. Perfect. So back in middle school, when you sprayed that Axe body spray, okay, and so did all of your friends, eventually it diffused throughout the entire boys' locker room, and that's why the whole thing smelled the way it did. Maybe we wished it would diffuse a little bit more. Um, all right, and what about effusion? Anybody? It's just diffusion through a small hole. Sweet, diffusion through a small hole. So we talked about that. I should have left some more space. Let me just write over here. Um, you might have seen like a simulation in class, right? And we had little gas particles and they were bouncing around, right? And every once in a while, one of them made it through the hole, right? So that's effusion. Okay, now what is, uh, what makes something effuse faster? Bigger hole. Would it be high temperatures? Yeah, so high temperatures makes it effuse faster. And what exact, and what, what effect does high temperatures have? It speeds them up, but yeah. the molecule also has to be smaller so that way it can get, it can speed up a lot quicker. Yeah, so you just described two, two things that can affect diffusion. You, you said temperature and you said mass, right? A higher temperature makes it diffuse faster. A, a lower mass makes it diffuse faster. And really all those are doing is affecting the speed. So if something moves faster in general, it will effuse and diffuse faster, okay? And the only two, the only two properties that affect the speed something's moving is mass and temperature. Okay. Now other things, there was homework where it was like, what happens to the speed if you increase the pressure? Okay, well, if I look at the equation, if I change the pressure, pressure's not in there. It doesn't care what the pressure is. Um, only temperature and mass affect the speed. Okay, and the speed is what affects diffusion and effusion. Okay, and as a result, there's an equation on your equation sheet, I'll write it over here, that says the rate of A over the rate of B equals the square root of the mass of B over the mass of A. And what that means is the rate that A effuses compared to the rate that B effuses is equal to this ratio. And the reason is, all this is saying is the speed. Jeremy, that last sentence cut out. Thanks. So it's saying the, the rate of effusion of A divided by the rate of effusion of The rate of effusion of A divided by the rate of effusion of B is just equal to this ratio. And all that comes from is this 3RT over M. Right? So this is just saying the rate of A is equal to the speed of A. The rate of B is equal to the speed of B. Okay? And when you just simplify that math, a lot of stuff cancels and you're left with that guy. But this is the equation that you care about. Okay? And now, using that equation, you're going to 
try and do this over here. An unknown gas diffuses 4.592 times slower than nitrogen gas. What's the molar mass of the unknown gas? Okay, take a minute and see if you can figure that out. All right, so do I know the rate that either gas is moving? No. No, I don't. But I know that I know the ratio of the rates, right? Right. So let's pick. Let's make gas A nitrogen and gas B my unknown. So this is going to be N2 and this is going to be my unknown. Well, I know that the unknown is moving slower. And if it's moving slower, it should have a lower rate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign one to the unknown, which would make nitrogen 4.592. Because if this, if the unknown is 4.592 slow, sorry, 4.592 times slower, nitrogen will be 4.592 times faster. Okay. And since all I care about the ratio, I could make this, two and nine point something, okay? And just double them. It's just the ratio I care about, okay? So then I'll have my mass of my unknown, by my mass of nitrogen. Nitrogen is 14 grams per mole, but this is N2, so it would be 28 grams per mole. Okay. Now I could put this in kilograms, that's fine but it doesn't actually matter because I'm dividing mass by mass. So whatever units I pick is just what I'll get on the other thing. All right, so do this math. And I get that the mass of the unknown is um, 0 0.590 kilograms or 590 grams per mole. Jeremy? Yes. How did you know that 4.592 went on top on one side of the equation and yeah. then the 0.028 went on the bottom on the other side? So the equation says that the rate of A over the rate of B equals the square root of the mass of B over the mass of A. Right. So then I just decided A is going to be my nitrogen. And what's moving faster, my nitrogen or my unknown? It says the unknown moves slower. So I need a bigger number on my nitrogen. So I, that's just tells me I need to put that 4.592 on. So I you cut out the, yeah, you cut out before the, right before you got to 4.592. So, so I say of these two things, which one is moving faster? Well, the unknown's moving slower. Okay. And so I need to have a bigger number on the nitrogen because it's moving faster. And so that number is going to be 4.592 and I just put one on the other thing. And then on the right side of the equation, I know the N2 is on the bottom because whatever's on the top on the left is on the bottom on the right. And that's just based off of the equation. I don't hey Jeremy, can you go over the math again? Yeah, you want me to show you, actually walk you through what I do here? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'll just, please. I'll write it right here. So on the right or on the left, I've got 4.592 equals the square root of the mass of the unknown over 0.028. So then what I'm going to do is I'm to get rid of that square root. I'm going to square both sides. And when I do that, I get 21.086 equals the mass of the unknown over 0.028. And I just multiply both sides by 0.028. And then I get 0 0.590 equals the mass of the unknown. And because my 0 0.028 was in kilograms per mole, the mass of my unknown will be in kilograms per mole. So 590 kilograms or 
sorry, 0.59 kilograms or 590 grams. Jeremy, could you explain why you used kilograms per mole instead of grams per mole? I, I could have used grams per mole. Okay. Yep. All right. You could use grams per mole. Which, um, can now you what, mind which elements are diatomic? Like since you did 28 and two, which, what are the ele other elements that would be two? Good question. So if you look at your periodic table, I always tell people to think seven up. Okay, so there's seven of them. You start at number seven, which is nitrogen, and then you draw seven. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And then the up is hydrogen. Does that make sense? So those are the seven diatomic elements. Okay, you feel okay about that? I'm gonna move some of this writing just so that it's not in the way. And we'll move on. All right. Um, I left something off of this problem. It wasn't actually solvable. Now it is. Okay, so we want the ideal and the van der Waals pressure of 2.5 liters of CH4 at 45 degrees Celsius and five moles of the gas. Okay, so we want to find the ideal pressure. Okay, ideal pressure is going to come from my ideal gas law and the van der Waals pressure is going to come from my van der Waals gas law. Okay, so take a minute and uh, see if you can find those. I tried to write that out um, to solve for P in a way that would make the math make sense. And when I did that, I got 
46.28 atmospheres. Jeremy, sorry, I think I missed it. Did you say they're going to give us how many moles are? Yeah, are yeah. that's why I wrote it right there because I forgot to put it on there. Okay, great. Yep. And this uh, Van der Waals equation is on your equation sheet. I actually just realized before this that I think I put a different version of the equation right here, but the one on your equation sheet isn't any more complicated, just a little bit different. So, um, cool. So, somebody explain to me why the Van der Waals pressure is a little bit less than the ideal pressure. Is that because the Van der Waals pressure accounts for the volume of the particles and for uh, the intermolecular forces experience? Yeah, so, and I, I like, to me it makes sense to think especially about intermolecular forces here because, um, because pressure, oh gosh. It's because pressure happens when particles bounce on the walls of the container, right? Well, if I've got a bunch of particles and things are bouncing and then they hit each other and they kind of stick to each other for a second, that's going to reduce the number of collisions with the wall of the container. So the intermolecular forces reduces the pressure, as you can see, once we account for them um, in the, with the Van der Waals equation. Uh, can you go through the math for the Van der Waals equation? So I've just rearranged it here. So I took what was on the right side and I divided by all this stuff, right? That's why it's now on the bottom. And then I subtracted this stuff over to the other side right there. Um, if you're having trouble putting it all in your calculator, I would say do it in separate pieces. Uh, plug just that guy into your calculator and then just this bottom part and then divide them and then do all this and subtract it. Um, it might, it's likely just a calculator issue if you're getting numbers that are far different. I got 48. Yeah, I also got 48. Mm -hmm. Same. Thank you for saying something, people. That's what I have on my key. 48.07? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You guys got to speak up. I do appreciate it. Um, sometimes I just plug stuff into my calculator wrong too. So, all right. Shall we move on? We shall, because you guys want to see some like combustion analysis and stuff like that. Um, unless maybe you all just like are geniuses. Um, the Van der Waals equation is on your equation sheet. All right, so density of sulfur hexafluoride at that temperature and pressure. Um, and because they actually just put the Van der Waals equation on the equation sheet last semester and they just put the density equation on the equation sheet last semester. Okay, so here we go. Density is pressure times the molar mass over R times temperature. So if we want to find the density of sulfur hexafluoride, I'll give you like a 15 second head start. I got 17.8 grams per liter. But I could have done it wrong because I'm not getting any amens. No, seven? Wait, I got 108 for the molar mass. Did I get the molar mass wrong? No, I think your molar mass is fine. I got the same molar Okay. Yeah, I got the same molar Okay, so now I'm getting a density of 7.119. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I got. Man, maybe I shouldn't have filled out my key while paying attention kind of in my other class today. 
<laughs> I'll just do You're all the math. Great. I'll just do all the math for real this instead of just looking at my key. <laughs> so far I am not doing too great. Okay. Um sweet. Questions about density? Those should be pretty straightforward problems now that they actually give you the, the equation for it. So So for sulfur so hexafluoride, you just had to write the write the the yeah, that and then yep. count it yourself. That's right. Yep. And could I have used kilograms here? Kilograms per mole? I could have, and then my answer would just be in kilograms per liter. But most of us tend to use mol just grams, right? Um, it's really just this root mean square equation that you need to use kilograms. All right. So let's do some partial pressure stuff. So an unknown gas is pumped into that size container. It's already got some oxygen in it. The unknown gas exerts a partial pressure of 2.3 atmospheres. Together, the total pressure is 11.2. What is the mole fraction? So I'm going to take a minute and talk about mole fraction. So mole fraction is just a percent. It's a percent of all of, my, of all the gas in my space. What percent of it, the moles, are, in this case, um, in this case, I'm looking for the unknown. So what percent of my moles are the unknown gas? Okay, that's a mole fraction. So it's going to be between zero and one, right? Or one and a hundred if you do it in percent. Um, now, why does that matter? Well, in my container, I have a certain amount of pressure, and that pressure happens because molecules are hitting the walls of the container. Right? Well, I've got multiple different molecules hitting the walls of the container, so some of my pressure is coming from molecule A, let's say, and some of my pressure is coming from molecule B. Well, whatever that mole fraction is, let's say mole fraction is moles of, I'm just going to say A over total moles. That's mole fraction. Well, that fraction is the same as your pressure fraction. So the pressure of A over the total pressure. Okay. In other words, if 20% of my moles are oxygen, then 20% of my pressure will be coming from oxygen. Okay. Now we usually, um, we often write the mole fraction as this X. And so then we could say XA equals pre partial pressure of A divided by total pressure. Okay. And so now if you have this guy, this problem becomes really easy. Because I'm trying to find the mole fraction and I have the pressure of my unknown is 2.3 atmospheres and the total pressure is 11.2 atmospheres, which means my mole fraction is going to be zero point two oh five. Okay, but this is really the key idea that should stick in your head because this is what is really applicable to other problems about mole fraction is that whatever the, whatever the percent of the moles are, that's the same fraction of the pressure for a given gas. Questions about that? I don't know if I explained that super well. But if you, if you don't know what so questions are. So the amount of moles within the, um, within the container is going to be equal to the mole fraction that we just got? That is? Uh, say that one more time. You're kind of breaking up a little bit. So basically, the mole fraction that we just got is going to be equal to like how many moles is of that uh, gas is present within the container. So this is not the number of moles in the container of that gas. This is the, the percent. So of all the moles, 20.5% are the unknown gas. And so if there's 10 moles, or if there's 100 moles, then there's 20.5 moles of the unknown. If there's a total of 10 moles, then there's 2.05 moles of the unknown. Okay, this is a percent, not an actual number of moles. It's equal to the moles of the unknown divided by the total moles. Okay. Hey, Jeremy, did you skip a question? Oh no, I just had one on my... Oh, so I rearranged it a little bit. Yep, so oh, okay. it'll, it'll come All up right. later. All right, sweet. Yep. All right, so you're, you're, uh, you're camping up in the mountains. You've got a pressure of 0.7 atmospheres. Um, 
Um, we have a fixed canister, so the pressure in the canister is 0.7 atmospheres. Compressed air. Um, uh, actually, I'm just reading this, and this problem doesn't make sense. Whatever, you've got a gas that's 0.7 atmospheres, okay, and, and it's 4.5 degrees Celsius. You throw it into the campfire that's 600 degrees Celsius. You want to know if the can's going to blow up, and the can can withstand two atmospheres of pressure. Okay, so there's two types of ideal gas problems that we can give you. One is to just give you PV equals NRT, just to give you three of these um, values and ask you for the fourth. Okay, and we did that up here, right? We asked, we gave you moles and temperature and volume and asked you for pressure. Well, the other type of problem we can give you is when you have a gas that's changing from one set of conditions into a different set of conditions. And that's what we have on this problem. Okay. And the way you set all of these up every time is I know that PV over NT equals R. And that's true for any gas. So that means PV over NT equal for one gas equals PV over NT for a different gas. I'm labeling it with ones and twos. Now I look at this and I say, are there any of these variables that are not changing? Because if they're not changing, I can delete them from both sides of the equation. So I look at the problem, what is changing? Well, I go from 0.7 atmospheres, okay, so we're talking about pressure, pressure's changing, okay, and my temperature's changing, and it does nothing about moles, so moles isn't changing, and there's nothing about, oh, what, volume, so volume isn't changing. Okay, so now I have this relationship P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. I know my pressure before is 0.7 atmospheres. My temperature before is uh, 4.5, which is what, 277? Yep. 277.65 Kelvin. My pressure afterwards is what I'm looking for, and my, vol or my temperature afterwards is 873.15 Kelvin. I just added the 0.15 because this was a decimal, so. All right, now I do the math on my calculator instead of looking at my key. And I got a pressure two of 2.2 atmospheres. So is the canister going to burst? Yes. yes. Yes, it will. Thank you for the participation. Love it. Okay, so now you get to try one. An empty balloon has 0.01 moles of air in it and has a volume of six milliliters. How many moles of air do you need to blow into the balloon to increase the volume to four liters. Remember, so this is a gas set going from one set of conditions to another. So I'm gonna start with P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2. So I got N2 is 6.667? Yeah. That's what I got. All right, so is I that the answer that. to the question? If, if we're splitting hairs, don't you want to subtract the 0 0.01 from it? Yeah, good job. Okay, because really what I asked you, how many moles of air do you need to blow into the balloon? Okay, and so it already had 0 0.01 moles in it, so the actual answer would be 6.657, right? 
Anyway, because we're splitting hairs. Again, it's a multiple choice test. So, All right, questions about that? So that's what you do if you're taking a gas from one set of conditions and changing it to a different set of conditions. All right, another mole fraction partial pressure issue. So a gas mixture has seven grams of nitrogen, two grams of hydrogen, and 16 grams of methane. What's the mole fraction of hydrogen in the mixture? And then we want you to calculate the partial pressure of hydrogen in the mixture at that volume and temperature. So remember we said mole fraction is this X thing. Okay, that's equal to the moles. So the mole fraction of H2 is gonna be the moles of H2 divided by the total moles. In other words, what percent of all the moles are hydrogen? So I need to find two things here. I need to find the moles of H2 and I need to find the total, total moles. How will I find the, the total moles? Calculate the moles for each one and then add them up. Yep, got seven grams of nitrogen. I know one mole of nitrogen is 28 grams, which gives me 0 0.25 moles of nitrogen. Two grams of hydrogen. One mole of H2 is two grams, which gives me one mole of hydrogen. And 16 grams of methane. One mole of methane is 16 grams. That's convenient. Which gives me one mole of CH4. So now, I want to find the mole fraction. It's just going to be moles of my hydrogen, which is one, divided by total moles, which is 2.25. So 0 0.44. All right, so now I'm trying to find what's the partial pressure of H2 in this mixture. Yeah, there's two ways to solve this problem. One is to say, I know that P equals NRT over V. And if I just plug in the moles of H2, I'm just gonna get the pressure of H2. The other way to do it is to use the total moles. Okay, and then after I get the total pressure, the red one. Once I get the total pressure, I multiply that by the mole fraction of H2, and that gives me the pressure of H2. Okay, so two ways to do it. Um, I'm going to do this way. Okay. Is it a big glass one? Or the bag? Glass jar? Cool. All right. All right, so we're going to do this. So I want to find the total pressure. It equals the total moles, 2.25 times R, times my temperature, which is 293, divided by my total volume, which is five liters. Pretty good, I don't need it. That gave me a total pressure of 10.82 atmospheres. And then I wanna find the partial pressure of hydrogen. So I'm gonna multiply that total pressure by the mole fraction of hydrogen. So the pressure of hydrogen is gonna be 10.82 atmospheres times my 0 0.44. And I do that. And I got 4.76 atmospheres. Cool. Questions about those? What was the first method that you used or that you could that have That I used? talked about, yeah. So the first one is, is just using the ideal gas law once. So basically the ideal gas law is P equals NRT over V. If I just plug in the moles of hydrogen, then I'll get the pressure of hydrogen. 
Okay, but if I plug in the total moles, I'll get the total pressure. And then I have to multiply by the mole fraction to get the partial pressure. Okay. Basically, we're just multiplying. At, in our problem, we multiplied by 0.44 at the end. If we did it this way, we just multiply it by 0.44 at the beginning, technically. It's the same math. So I got 4.809 doing it the way you didn't. That's, that's the same answer. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, Can you're good. you go through the math for that, for the new equation that you just showed us? This one? Yeah. Yep, so I would say the pressure of H2 equals the moles of H2, and I have one mole of H2 times R times T. I have uh, friends that do a couple of like a sore throat today, too. Sorry, Max, I muted you. Um, over volume, which is five. I do that and I got pressure of H2 equals 4.81. Uh, cool. So those are essentially the same answer. Um, either way is, is the same. All right. Oh. Should we prefer one over the other for the test since it nope. is going to be multiple choice? No. Nope. They're literally the exact same thing. The only, like, I probably just got different answers because I. No, I literally have no idea what. It's just because really this isn't 0.44, it's 0.44444. That's what got us a different answer. That was the only difference. So that second way is easier, I guess. Uh, yeah, if you think it's easier. The problem is sometimes uh, they might not give you the information to do it that way. Sometimes you maybe they just give you the total pressure instead of making you calculate it. And then you would have to know that you need to multiply by the mole fraction. So I actually, I showed this way because it's kind of one more step. But yeah, if they give you this information, that way's easier. Will they give right. us the, um, the equation for like the partial pressure? Will they give you the equation? Yeah. Nope. So that's why you've got to remember the pressure of A over the total pressure equals the moles of A over the total moles, which is just the mole fraction of A. All right, we're going to transition out of gases into intermolecular forces. Nice. You cut out that last sentence, but was it just a transition sentence? Yeah, yeah we're just going to transition out of gases into intermolecular forces. So um, usually I would have you break up and talk to each other about this, but you are all broken up already. So um, we're gonna go through the six intermolecular forces. We're gonna describe the charges that make up each force and give an example of each one. So when I say the charges that make up each force, all of these intermolecular forces exist because you have two particles that have a charge that are attracted to each other. Okay, but there's, multi there's three different ways we can have a charge. The strongest is to be an ion. That means that you have completely gained or lost some number of electrons. So you have a full charge all the time. Okay, the next strongest is to be polar or to have a dipole. Those are synonymous. And the last is if you're not polar, then you have an induced dipole. Okay, so I should have left more space for this. Um, Would London dispersion forces be considered induced dipole? Yeah, so London dispersion forces are between two molecules that have induced dipoles. Okay, so these are the types of charges our molecules can have. And so now we'll describe what our intermolecular force is based on which type of molecules we have. So I think you'll see your, your question answered in a second. All right, so intermolecular forces are between two different molecules, right? So if molecule one is an ion and molecule two is an ion, we call the intermolecular force ion, ion, or just ionic. If molecule one is an ion and molecule two is polar, 
right? So we have one of these and one of these. We call that ion dipole. Molecule one is polar and molecule two is polar. We call that dipole dipole. Write it all out. Molecule one is polar, molecule two is nonpolar. In other words, it has an induced dipole. I won't write it there. Then we call it dipole induced dipole. And if molecule one is nonpolar and molecule two is nonpolar, we call that induced dipole, induced dipole. But because it's so common, it has a common name, which is London dispersion. So the names of these intermolecular forces are quite literally just named after what are the charges that my two molecules have. Now I skipped one here. What did I skip? Hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen bonds. Yep. And hydrogen bonding is just a unique form of dipole-dipole that's really, really strong. Okay. And so for hydrogen bonding, in your first molecule, I'm going to draw lines so it's not messy. In your first molecule, you need to have an FH bond, an OH bond, or an NH bond. And then in your second molecule, you need an F, an O, or an N. Did you rank those intermolecular forces from strongest to weakest? Or? That's how I ranked them. They are. They are, yep. This is strong. This is weak. Okay, so that's where the names of the intermolecular forces come from. So. A quick question. Uh-huh. I remember in lecture or somewhere, someone mentioned that H bonding was the strongest. Um, with that list, it's not the case. It's, it's so just really just not the case. So it's, it's really strong. You might have heard that it's the strongest dipole, and you might have just heard somebody say something that was not true. Okay. Um, but because we, we often talk about how strong it is, people think it's the strongest, but it's not. And that's why, that's why water at room temperature is a liquid, but your salt is a solid because ion ion is way stronger than hydrogen bonding. But good question. Um, it comes up a lot. Question. Yep. Um, so the, for the hydrogen bonding, are, do both molecules have to have um, those like F, O, or N with the hydrogen connected to it? Or can it just be um, one side and the other one can be free? Uh, the other one can be free. So for example, um, if I had water, Oh, I drew that backwards. If I had water, this has a dipole that's partially positive, that's partially negative, right? And then if I had acetone, that's partially negative. And so you have an OH in molecule one and an O in molecule two, so you get a hydrogen bond right there. Okay, so if they were both, if uh, both of them had um, hydrogens on them, Covalent bonds to hydrogen, yeah. Yeah, that would still like work. Yeah, for sure, because you you still have, you know, an OH in one molecule and an O in the other molecule, so you're still good. Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, let's talk about how these um, intermolecular forces, the strength of the intermolecular forces, affects um, properties, and then we'll go through some actually identifying intermolecular forces. Okay. So first off, we're going to say what happens when my intermolecular force goes up in strength? What happens to boiling point? You know, I'll unmute and just say it in unison. It goes up. Increases. Increases. It goes up. Uh, okay, goes melting up. point. Up. Vapor pressure. Up. Increases. Vapor pressure actually goes down. It decreases. <laughs> Somebody's like laughing because they just think this is so funny. But, you know. Anyway. All right. Vapor pressure goes down. So let's talk about what vapor pressure is. <laughs> vapor pressure is the idea. Vapor pressure is the idea that 
Um, anytime I have a liquid with space above it, some of those liquid particles break into the gas phase. And in the gas phase, they exert a partial pressure, right? So, and we call that the vapor pressure. So if I have stronger intermolecular forces, it's harder to break into the gas phase. And so my, my pressure up there is lower. Okay, so if I have strong intermolecular forces, the vapor pressure goes down. It's related Wait, to- Wait, is this volatility? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So vapor pressure is how we measure volatility. What's the difference between vapor pressure and evaporation? Uh, I don't know why I wrote that, but we can do it anyway. There are, these are all related. Okay, so, so if I have a high volatility, I will have a high vapor pressure and I will be likely to evaporate. Does that make sense? They're all related that way. So evaporation also goes down. They're all talking about the same concept. All right, what happens to viscosity with higher intermolecular forces? My molecules are sticking to each other more. So am I gonna become more viscous or less? Or more. 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 So viscosity, viscosity is the honey effect, okay? It's, it's a resistance to flow. So stronger intermolecular forces will be harder to flow. Surface tension? Increase. Increase. And solubility? Decrease. Decrease. It actually depends. Okay. It depends. It de depends, right? Because things that are have similar intermolecular forces have similar solubility. So polar dissolves in polar. Okay. And nonpolar dissolves in nonpolar. So literally, if you take a crayon and you put, crayons are just like wax, right? So they're just hydrocarbons. So they just experience London dispersion. If I were to put a crayon in a glass of water, it'll just stay a crayon. But if you were to take a crayon and put it in, um, like my wife is making fun of the way I say crayon. If I were to put a crayon in um, oil or in hexane, okay, it'll dissolve. So try it sometime. You can impress your uh, social distancing partner. All right, um, we also see that ion, ionic things dissolve in polar solvents. But what do you think? If I'm trying to dissolve an ion, do I want a, in water, do I want a strong ionic compound or a weak ionic compound? Weak, weak, weak. weak right? Because if I look at the list, ion ion is stronger than, than polar. So if I want, this to be similar intermolecular forces to polar, I need a weak ion ion, okay? So lower lattice energy. All right, so now we're gonna actually rank some. Now we're gonna actually rank some based on melting points. So again, me decreasing melting point means decreasing intermolecular force strength, okay? So number one is going to be the, uh, strongest intermolecular force we've got. And number seven is gonna be the weakest intermolecular force we've got. So take a minute, see if you can do it. And I actually don't like this, so I'm gonna actually change this to KF. Did you already try to do Lord of the Rings music? I. I think that it would not work very well because you would just get this crazy in and out, quiet, loud. I don't think it would work very well, but, but we can sing it if you want. If somebody wants to volunteer. What kind of accent? Is Hiram going to sing Lord of the Rings music to us in an accent? I wish. Okay, so we're looking for, we're gonna rank in terms of decreasing melting point. So the first step is just to say, what is the dominant intermolecular force in each of these compounds? So let's look at this first one. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna take my list of intermolecular forces.
I'm going to stick it right here so that we can reference it. Or down there. That's cool too. Okay, so I'm looking for the strongest intermolecular force in this thing, so I'm going to start at the top because this is the strongest. First question I ask is this ionic or covalent? I didn't get any. Oh, you're chopping a lot. I didn't understand what you said. Wow, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, first question to ask is this ionic or is it covalent? Covalent. Covalent, which means it's not ion ion. Okay. Is it even possible? Well, not a good way to ask the question. If I just give you one molecule, right, that means I'm looking at the force between this molecule and another one of that molecule. So this is molecule one and molecule two. So if that's the case, is something like ion dipole even possible? No. No, because ion dipole means you have two different molecules. Okay, so I, I can just eliminate that. And what's the other one I can just eliminate? I can just eliminate dipole induced dipole if I'm just given one molecule. Because this means I have one molecule that's polar and one that's nonpolar. And since I only have one molecule, that's not possible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you eliminate a hydrogen bonding because it doesn't have fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen? Yeah. So as we're just going to keep moving down. And you're right. So is there any hydrogen bonding in here? No. no. Okay. Is this a polar molecule? No. Trick. No. If it's just carbons and hydrogens, it's not polar. And so now I'm just left with London dispersion. So this bad boy is London dispersion. Okay. There's another molecule in here that looks very similar. It's just carbons and hydrogens, and that's this guy. So it's also London dispersion. All right, let's go to this next one. How do we know between which of those two, which one's stronger and which one's weaker? We'll get there. Let's assign them all first. Okay, so now this guy, ionic or covalent? Covalent. Covalent, so it's not ion ion. Is there any hydrogen bonding in there? Yes. No. Yeah, with the, with the oxygen. There's, there's actually yes. not, because this is a CH3 to an O oh, to right. a CH3. There's no hydrogen on that oxygen. Okay, so then is it polar? No. no. It is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Because what's the shape? I've got two lone pairs on there. What's the shape around that oxygen? With two lone pairs. Steric number of four. It's going to be bent. And if it's bent, that's not a balanced molecule. So that's polar. Since it's bent, it's going to be polar. Okay. KF, is it ionic or covalent? Ionic. It's ionic. So that means I'm done. All right, this bottom one, what does it have? H bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Na2O? Na2O is ion ion. It's ionic. And H2O? H bonding. It's hydrogen bonding. Okay. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, yep. Um, just really quickly, this might be a dumb question, but could you just go over how to quickly tell if it's an ionic or a covalent bond without using the chart? Yes. Thank you. As long as you don't mean without using the periodic table. No, I mean without using like the chart that has the, the electronegativity. Yeah. Yeah, the electronegativity table. Yeah. So this is what my periodic table looks like. Right. Everything over here are metals except hydrogen. Everything over here are nonmetals. If I get a metal with a nonmetal, that is ionic. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Cool. Okay. So now I have to actually rank these. Well, first off, I know that the strongest ion ion, those are going to have the, uh, the um, highest melting point. So they're going to, this is kind of getting double negatives, but I'm decreasing melting point. So one is going to be the strongest intermolecular force. Okay. So, um, so it's going to be one of these ionic things. So how do we differentiate between ion ions?
difference in electronegativity? Lattice energy. Lattice, lattice energy. energy. Lattice energy. Okay, and what is lattice energy based off of? There's two things. Charge and charge. Charge and size. Okay, so I'm going to assign the charges. A K is a plus and an F is a minus. And an N is a plus and an O is a two minus. So what's automatically the strongest? MA2O. MA2O. So that's going to be number one. And that's going to be number two. Jeremy, when this when it's the same like charge like plus yeah. and minus, how do you tell then is like the biggest? Then I look at the size. Do I want to be bigger or smaller? The smaller is the stronger one, right? Smaller is the stronger one. Yep, because I can get like these are two big ones, two small ones. I can get those charges closer together. Okay. Right, and that's going to make a stronger attraction. All right. Thanks. All right. So that's my ion. So let's move down. Then I've got hydrogen bonding. So both of these are hydrogen bonding. Okay. So the first thing to look at when I'm comparing two hydrogen bondings is how many groups do they have that can hydrogen bond? So this molecule looks like this and water looks like this. So how many groups does this have that can hydrogen bond? Two. And this one? One. It actually has two. Three. Because it can go that way and that way. Okay, so they both have, you can think of it as if they both have two regions that can hydrogen bond, then their hydrogen bonding is like equivalent. So then what do we look at? Would it be London dispersion forces? Yeah. Yep, because they both have London dispersion as well because everything has London dispersion. So which one has stronger London dispersion? The big one. The, the big one. one. Okay, so that's going to make this guy three and this one four. Okay, and that brings can me... Can you go through that again? Yep. Can you go through why water can have two hydrogen bonds on it? So water like doesn't the, have two hydrogen bonds on it. It has two OH groups that can hydrogen bond. Just like this one has two OH groups that can hydrogen bond. So there's one O, there's one O and two OH groups for water. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, and with your CH three O CH three, since they're OC groups and not OH groups, they can't hydrogen bond. These. No, sorry, you get a different molecule, the dipole, dipole, CH3, OCH3. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that one's not an OH group, so it can't hydrogen bond. That's right. Because remember, the hydrogen bond, I drew it up here, I think. The hydrogen bond, the, this hydrogen sits in the middle of the hydrogen bond, right? So down on this water, I've got two hydrogens that can sit in the middle of a hydrogen bond. Okay, so what comes next? I'm sorry, why was the London dispersion force uh, bigger for the bigger molecule? Is that just how it is? Like if it's bigger, it has a stronger London dispersion? Or That's exactly there... how it is. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that pretty soon. Okay, so what, what's number five? That be the, the dipole dipole? Not the extender is like. Okay, the dipole dipole is going to be number five because that's just next on the list. And now I have two London dispersion. Could you quickly go over why the dipole dipole is a dipole dipole and not just London dispersion? So you could draw the molecule like that, right? And that looks linear and balanced as if it's a nonpolar molecule. But this oxygen has two lone pairs on it. Okay, and with two lone pairs, my steric number is four. So my electron geometry is tetrahedral. And my molecular geometry is bent. Okay, so just like a water molecule is bent, and so we say that that's polar because these dipoles don't balance each other out. This is polar because those dipoles don't balance each other out. This molecule is also bent, and it's polar because these dipoles don't balance each other out. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. All right, so now let's look at, we've got two London dispersion. What is the first thing to look at when you're trying to compare London dispersion? 
structure. Isn't it like length? Branch size. Size. Size, size, size. Mm -hmm. The more electrons I have, the more I can squish those electrons around and get a dipole. Okay. And so if I look at these two London dispersions, okay, which one has a which one is bigger? They're the same. They're the same. So I so this one looks like this. Okay, and this one looks like this. So their size is exactly the same. So then what do I look at? Look at the shapeability. Yeah. The flatter the better. Because flatter molecules can get all up on each other like this. Okay, and they can they can interact more than these tie fighting looking molecules. And so just to clarify, the shape of the top one is denoted by the parentheses around that CH3. That means mm -hmm. that it's like off the top, right? Yeah, so I've got this CH3 on the left. That's an end. And then I just have a CH. Well, it needs two more things on it. And this tells you one of those things is an end branch right there, and the other is an end branch right there. So, so the straighter one has greater London dispersion forces? Yep, so this would be number six, and this would be number seven. Okay, so I tried to include as many concepts in this one problem as we could to try and learn how do we rank ion ion, how do we rank hydrogen bonding, how do we rank London dispersion. And how do you find the steric number really quick? Like here? Steric yeah. numbers, bonds plus lone pairs. So one, two, three, four. Okay, thanks. Yep. Jeremy? Yep. So is it, with London dispersion forces, is it increased size or is it the number of electrons that determines? So you, good question. You can think of it as increased, like, it's really, it's the number of electrons. Okay. So, yeah, there was a one homework problem that was comparing like O2 and N2. Um, sorry, Clayton, I'm going to mute you just because of the background noise. So O2 and N2, right? Even though N2 is a larger, has larger radius on the atoms, O2 has stronger London dispersion because it has more electrons. So you can think of electrons, you can think of molar mass. Uh, usually that's correlated with actual size, but not across a row. Okay, you ready to keep going? Yep, that's good. Yes. Thanks. Okay, that was a beefy question, but that was on purpose. Um, all right, we're going to order list an order of increasing solubility in water. Okay, increasing solubility in water. It's going to something's going to dissolve in water if it has similar intermolecular forces. Water has hydrogen bonding which is just a form of dipole, dipole, right? So what here is definitely gonna dissolve the best? OH group two, three. Number three. Yeah, three, three is definitely gonna dissolve the best um, in order of increasing. So this is gonna be, this is confusing. A, B, C, D. So this is the best, right? Okay, and then what's gonna be next? A. Yep, because that's dipole dipole. And now I've got these two. What are both of those? Both ionic. Companies. Both ionic. Okay, and we said if I want to dissolve something that's ionic in water, do I want stronger ionic or weaker ionic? Weaker. Weaker. Okay. So let's look at these. How do I how do I distinguish strength of ionic compounds? Size, oh, charge, and then size. Perfect. Uh, oh, this is not a real thing. That's not a yeah. two on it. Yeah, I was gonna say something. Thanks. Sorry, guys. Okay, so there are my charges. So what's gonna be easier to dissolve? D. D is gonna be easier to dissolve because it has a lower lattice energy, right? So this is gonna be uh, two, and that's gonna be the hardest. Feel okay Wait, about why that? Is C, why is C the most soluble? Because this C has hydrogen bonding, water has hydrogen bonding. 
Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Should we get out of this intermolecular force world? Okay. Well, sweet. All right. So label the hand emojis on the phase diagram. Take a, just a couple seconds and make sure you know what all each of those represents. Okay, what's this one? Yes. There's some participation. See, we got out of we got out of intermolecular force force world, and everybody's pumped to share. Okay, what's what's the peace sign? Solid. Solid. And the Solid. that's liquid. Um, what's our a okay? Super critical. Critical. critical point. Critical point. And our hang loose. Tree, triple point. Okay, what about this guy? That's uh, evaporation. evaporation. Yeah. Boiling point. Yeah, yeah boiling, boiling point. point. That's the word we use in English. Boiling. And this one. Melting point. Melting, Melting point. point. Melting point. point. And this guy. Deposition. Deplimation or sublimation? Yeah. Cool. And did I miss any? Nope, I didn't. Uh, what does it mean to, what is like normal melting point? What does that mean? Melting point at one atmosphere? Yeah, normal just means at atmospheric pressure. Okay, so like this entire line is a bunch of melting points at different pressures, right? I pick a pressure, it tells me the temperature that I melt. So then the normal melting point is the pressure is one atmosphere. What is the melting temperature at one atmosphere? except that's not melting. I lied. That's boiling, but you get the point. Hey, Jeremy, this is only for water, right? So this, so I think what you're talking about is this line. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. So everything we've talked about thus far is for anything. Okay, but we have this question here. Does this solid phase float or sink? on its liquid phase based float. on this graph float. it floats float. okay float. and if you like what the heck how do people know that it floats it has to do with the slope of this line okay so we have phase diagrams where this line goes uh down to the right and somewhere it goes up to the right and the way that i remember because i literally forget every time and then i just reteach myself is if i have if I have a solid, okay, and I increase the pressure, I squeeze those molecules together, okay, it's gonna get more dense and increasing the pressure is gonna become a liquid, okay? That means the liquid is more dense than the solid and so the solid's gonna float. But if my line goes this way and I have a liquid and I increase the pressure and the density, I'm gonna become a solid, which means the solid is more dense and it's gonna sink. But if you can just remember between now and when you take the test that if the line goes to the left and the solid floats, that is good enough for you. Isn't that literally only the case with water? There's other molecules that do it too, but um, but pretty much just water. That's water's the only normal one that we see, but there's other molecules that do it. Um, and why is that good? Why is it good that water floats? That ice floats on water. I love how everybody <laughs> waits the exact same amount of time before finally deciding that they'll be the one to sacrifice and talk. Yeah, so um, at the bottom of the ocean, what's the pressure? Pressure is super, super, super high. But fortunately here, increased pressure decreasing decreases the temperature at which something freezes. So if if this line went the other way, if it went that way, at the bottom of the ocean, water would turn into ice um, and the oceans would just freeze solid and we'd have no fish. So if you're the type of person left the solid floats, is that some 
Just remember the weird letters match. Okay, thanks, Samuel. All right. Um, anyway, so it's nice that it floats. And why does it why does it expand when it freezes? Are you ready? Cut out, Jeremy. Cut out. Why does it expand when it freezes? Because of the tetrahedral shape. Yeah, with this shape, if it wants to maximize hydrogen bonds, I'm not going to draw it. I don't know what it looks like. But it just results in it expanding, and it makes kind of hexagonal shapes. That's why you get snowflakes with six directional symmetry, because of hydrogen bonds. Anyway, let's start talking about stoichiometry. Yeah, we're almost done. All right, stoichiometry. So we want to balance these equations. Okay, take a minute, see if you can balance them yourself. Shouldn't CO2 be 2? Yep. Thanks. Did I do that wrong then? Then this is wrong. 8 plus 4 is 12. 6 supposed to be 3. 3. Okay, and then those look good. Okay, now we want to write and balance the following reactions. So a solution. Wait, Jeremy, of, do you have any like do you have any rules for this? Or like does it just you have to just do it, like figure it out? Like, are there any tricks? The only thing that I usually tell people is if I've got like an oxygen by itself, I'm gonna leave that till the end because <coughs> I can make it whatever I want and it's not gonna affect anything else. Does that make sense? Whereas like any of the other ones, yeah. if I change if I change the number for oxygen, I screw up carbon. The other thing mm -hmm. is if you get stuck, sometimes it's a good uh, tool just to double it um, and then see if that resolves your problem. But, hey, Jerry, the end of the question. Yeah. Is it like risky to, since it's just multiple choice, just to kind of count the atoms? But then some would be like, I guess different multiples. Would that be like kind of a risky thing to do? So if, if they're just say balance the equation and there's like multiple, it's multiple choice, then you could just count the atoms. The problem is it's, it's probably going to be in the context of a different problem okay. where you have, you have to balance it and then you have to do something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Uh, so write and balance the following equations. Okay. I'm just going to write these out just because I think that the real skills of stoichiometry, I don't want to lose time on those because we're just, remembering how to name stuff. So this is going to be lead to nitrate. And it says it's a solution. That means the phase is aqueous, AQ. That means dissolved in water. We Plus, always have to write the phase of the... Um, multiple choice. So nope. Thanks. Yeah, multiple choice helps a lot, doesn't it? I'm just going to get rid of it because just pointed out that it really doesn't matter. Okay, PB3, PO4. Correct me if I do any of these wrong. Obviously, I'm not on too hot of a streak today. Three, two, one, six. And then combustion. What does it mean to combust something? What do I add? Oxygen. Mm -hmm. Oxygen. And if it's, what are my products here? CO2 and carbon dioxide. CO2 and water. Okay, if I burn a hydrocarbon, I get CO2 and water. Um, okay, now balancing this, I get 11, 7, and 8. 
All right. If I burn 275 grams of heptane, which is this guy, how much CO2 do I get? All right. What is the weird new stuff about questions like this? And what's the indicator? I look at this problem and I see that they give me information about heptane and they ask for information about carbon dioxide. Okay. There's only one way that we really have learned to switch between Oh, I'm sorry if I keep cutting out. I blame Google Fiber and the other 14 billion people in Provo on the internet right now. Um, okay, so 275 grams of heptane. They give me information about heptane. They ask for information about CO2. That tells me that I need to find some way to jump between heptane and CO2. And that way is a balanced equation. So I have this balanced equation that relates heptane to CO2. But what are the units on these coefficients? Moles. 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 So I've got to get whatever they give me into moles, and then I can make the jump. Okay, so I've got my 275 grams of heptane. I've got to get it into moles. And if I want to get grams of heptane into moles of heptane, what do I use? One hundred grams. Yeah. The molar mass, right? That's switched between grams and moles. Now I'm in moles, so now I can use my equation. And the equation tells me that one mole of C7H16 gives me seven moles of CO2. And then I can say that one mole of CO2 is 44 grams. That's just off the periodic table. And I got um, 847. Yep. Okay. But the real skill here is this. Whoa, that was a bad line. Not a very skilled line. That's the real skill here. Okay. Jumping from moles of one compound to moles of a different compound. Jeremy, can you explain again how you got those two uh, equations? For the, the yes. heptane and yeah, the um, this first one, I said, all right, I've got lead to nitrate. That's this, and phosphoric acid is this. Produces lead to phosphate, which is this, and nitric acid, which is this. So this kind of goes. Go ahead. Sweet. Yeah. And then combustion. So I intentionally didn't tell you the products here. I don't know that they'll expect you to know combustion. Okay. But uh, later on, um, we're going to do more of combustion. So you should know that combustion, you always add oxygen. And then if it's just carbons and hydrogens and oxygens here, you just get CO2 and water every time. What if there was something else? Yeah. So if there was something else, I would imagine that they would tell you what the products are. Um, yep. So I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. In the first reaction above, so now we're dealing with this reaction. So I'm actually just going to um, move it down here so we can reference it. Whoa, that didn't work. Okay. 285 grams of lead to nitrate and 0.85 moles of phosphoric acid react. What's the limiting reactant? Okay. Other than me asking, what is the limiting reactant? What in this problem tells you that you have to find the limiting reactant? Uh, the amounts that are given below are what makes it like, what makes you think that you have to use the limiting reactant thing? So the real giveaway is that they give me amounts of both reactants, right? In this problem, I only gave you an amount of one of the reactants, which tells me, well, I, that's just going to be what defines my equation. Okay. But if they give me amounts of both reactants, then I know that one of them is going to run out first and whichever one runs out first, that's the one that defines everything for the reaction. 
Okay, so if they give me amounts of two reactants, I have to find the limiting reactant. Okay, how do, how do we find the limiting reactant? There's multiple ways. So how do you find the limiting reactant? Anybody have a method that they just dig? Actually, we didn't hear any of that. You oh my know. gosh. I'm sorry, guys. Um, how do you find the limiting reactant? All ratios. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one way to do it is to find the moles of this and the moles of this and see how that compares to this mole ratio. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's a perfectly good way. I'm not going to do it that way. What I like to do is take both of my reactants and convert them to one of my products and see which one makes less. Okay. Um, and the reason I like that is because um, usually it answers the next question because usually it asks you uh, how much of um, one of your products is produced. Okay. So I just like to pick that product um, and convert to it. So let's pick this one. Let's convert both of these to PB3PO4. My 285 grams PBNO3. Okay, if I want to use this equation, I've got to get to moles. And one mole of PBNO3 is 331.2 um, grams. One mole of PBNO32, sorry, not one. The equation tells me three moles of PBNO32 makes one mole of PB3PO42. One mole of PB3PO42 weighs 811.54 grams. Could we just leave it at moles instead yeah. of grams? Yep, you could just leave it at moles um, and then you can compare moles. I just know that later on they're going to ask me how much of my product I make. So I'm just going all the way to grams, but you're right. And that gives me 232.8 grams of PB3PO42. All right, so then I have my second thing, which is my. Um, 0 0.85 moles of H3PO4. I'm going to convert that to grams of my product. And I'm already in moles, so I can just say that two moles of H3PO4 makes one mole of PB3PO42. I know one mole of PB3PO42 is 11.54 grams. And when I do that, I got 344.9 grams. So what's my limiting reactant? Lead nitrate. Yep, lead nitrate's my limiting reactant because it makes less product. So my reaction's running, it's making PB3PO42, okay, and um, and once I've made 232.8 grams, I run out of PBNO3, reaction stops. Okay, so in other words, PBNO32 defines everything in my reaction. Okay, this number doesn't matter because I'm never gonna make it. Okay, this number is what matters. This number is what matters. Okay. So did you just pick the, the lead phosphate? Like, could you have used the hydrogen nitrate? Yep, yep, I just picked one. And one, so are we going to hardcore have to know the polytimic ions? So this yeah, testing? somebody asked at the beginning, like this is the context in which you might have to know the polytomic ions. I would hope, if I'm not mistaken, last semester they told them they don't need to worry about having them memorized for this test, but I haven't heard anybody say that this semester. So that's why I'm hesitant to say, oh, you're good. Um, you're cutting out. 
Um, last semester, I don't think they had to know them for this test, but nobody said that this semester, and that's why I'm hesitant to say that you don't need to know them. Technically, it's fair game. Okay. All right, how much excess reactant is left over? Um, I mentioned earlier, or I said, that this, that the limiting reactant defines everything in my reaction. So it defines how much of the product I'm going to make. It defines how much of this product I'm going to make. Okay. But if I convert my 285 grams of PbNO32, if I convert it into my other reactant, what does that tell me? I'm going to get some... Use? Go ahead. What you used of the exactly. other Exactly. I convert it into my other reactant, it tells me how much of the reactant I used up. Okay, so if I want to figure out how much is left over, if I can figure out how much I used up, I just subtract it from what I started with. Okay, so let's do that real quick. So I've got my grams of PBNO32. Um, to moles. My reaction says three moles of this makes two moles of this. And I'm going to, they gave me they gave me this in moles, so I'm just going to stop at moles. So I've got my 0.574 moles of, of H3PO4. Is that how much is left over? You're cutting in and out again. So is this how much H3PO4 is left over? No. No. It's how, how much, much is used. used. So how do I figure out how much is left over? You might have the one that they gave you against that one, and then you get the how much is left over. So I started with 0.85 moles, right? So then I sub start with my 0.85, move this. I subtract how much I used. That tells me how much I have left. All right, now, this is confusing. If 200 grams of PB3PO42 is produced, what's the percent yield? How do we figure out percent yield? Actual yield divided by theoretical. Perfect. Theoretical is the number we get, and then the actual is the one that's the number that they give. Yep, theoretical is math. Okay, so we did math. What's our theoretical yield? It's my 232.8, and the actual is 200. Will they only ever give us the actual yield? Uh, I mean, Unless you have the theoretical and you have the percent. Well, how do I say this? They either have to give you the actual or they have to give you the other two things, the theoretical and the percent. Does that make sense? Like there's no way to calculate the actual. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I get So why doesn't it, Go ahead. sorry, why mm -hmm. doesn't it, uh, like why isn't it perfect? Why doesn't it, what, what, what is the error? So there's a lot of things that can happen. You could have dirty glassware or you could just maybe some of it evaporates or just stuff like that. Or you'll learn if you take Chem 106, reactions don't actually go to completion. They have some equilibrium where they stop. 
part of the way through the reaction. And so, um, so you don't always get 100%. Does that make sense? Okay, let's see. I want to get down here and do these two uh, before we run out of time. So, find the molecular formula from the following percent compositions. Okay. So, if they give you percent compositions, a molecular formula is, is mole ratios, right? H2O means two moles of hydrogen for one mole of oxygen. So we've got to get these percents and get them into mole ratios. Okay, do you guys remember how to do that? You assume 100 grams. You assume 100 right? grams and just... Yeah. Perfect. Assume 100 grams, convert mass to moles. And then to get nice numbers, we divide by the smallest. And then we multiply to get whole numbers. Okay, so we assume 100 grams because then our percents just turn into grams, right? So we get 64.8 grams of carbon, 13.62 grams of hydrogen, and the rest is oxygen. So 100 minus 64.8 minus 13.62 gives me 21.8. Five eight grams of oxygen. So I assumed 100 grams. Now I'm going to turn my my uh, masses into moles. One mole of carbon is 12.011 grams. Gives me 5.395 grams of carbon or moles of carbon. Thirteen point five one three moles of carbon and one point three four eight eight moles of oxygen. Okay, now these are fine numbers. These are correct mole ratios, but I don't want to make my equation C 5.395 H 13.513, right? That's gross. I want nicer numbers. So to get nicer numbers, I divide by the smallest thing I've got. So that guarantees that nothing's going to be less than one. So I get 0.018. So I get 3.9999. Okay, so this is pretty much four. It's pretty much 10. This is one. And so my formula is C4H10O. Now, is that empirical or is that molecular? Miracle. How do I figure out the molecular weight? You gotta add all these up and then you gotta divide it. Yep, I know my mass is 148.28 grams per mole for my molecular formula. Well, my empirical formula, if I add it up, I get 74 grams per mole. So what do I have to multiply this by to get this? Two. So I need to multiply this by two and I get C8H20O2 is my molecular formula. Make enough sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yep. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, guys, last one. Here we got this combustion analysis problem. Okay, what combustion analysis is doing is it's taking an unknown hydrocarbon 
So I don't know what those subscripts are. I burn it to get CO2 and water. And then I use my amounts of CO2 and water um, to learn what my empirical formula was. And so when we wanted to make our empirical formula, we needed to find grams of carbon, grams of hydrogen, and grams of oxygen, and then we could do it. Well, that's what we're trying to figure out here. So we're gonna take our 3.14 grams of CO2 and we're gonna convert it into grams of carbon because all of this carbon came from there. So then I'll know how much carbon I started with. Okay, and when you're doing these problems, it's important to carry out your decimals because otherwise it can, the error compounds if you round too much. So, this is an important step to understand one mole of CO2 has one mole of carbon in it, okay? Because it's C1O2. Okay. All right, and then I can get that into grams. I get 0 0.85697 grams of carbon. You got a friend over there, Catherine? My okay. okay, so then I have my water. So I found my grams of carbon. Now I'm going to find my grams of hydrogen from my water. In this case, one mole of water has two moles of hydrogen in it because it's H2O. Now, how do I find my grams of oxygen? Um, hydrogen and hydrogen masses and then subtract that from the initial. Mm -hmm. I can't use these because I added oxygen. So those won't tell me how much oxygen was here. Okay, but I do know I started with one gram and I'd have my grams of carbon and grams of hydrogen. But what happens when I do one minus my amounts of each of these? There's zero oxygen. Yep. You get pretty much zero grams. So there's no oxygen in this thing. So it's just C and H. And that's fine. So now, just like up here, I took my mass to moles divided by the smallest. That's what I'm going to do now. So I've got my mass of carbon and hydrogen. Let's turn them into moles. Jeremy, can we, can we assume that there's no oxygen because it just says hydrocarbon? Or do hydrocarbons sometimes have oxygen? So I wanted to assume, I, I think hydrocarbons means there's no oxygen in it. But I wanted, I mean, you can do the math and you can check, right? I thought that the hydro meant that it was, uh, it was like hydroxide and it had, oh no, never mind, I'm going crazy. <laughs> You're good, David. <laughs> now to get nice numbers, I divide by the smallest thing. Me, 
this one gets me one. This gets me 2.0073. So this is one, this is pretty much two. So my empirical formula is CH2. <coughs> okay, so that's my empirical. How do I get from there in my molecular? Yeah, did it before. By a whole number, right? Yep, got to multiply by a whole number. Well, this empirical formula has a mass of 14 grams per mole, and my hydrocarbon has a mass of 42 grams per mole. So, what do I need to multiply by? Three. Right. Three. Is that three? C3H6. Samuel, your background is the reason that I'm losing internet connection. He's playing the John Cena horse. All right. Um, I, I'm just imagining that you're all laughing. I just can't hear you because you're muted. All right. So that's how I get my molecular formula. So the really nice thing about these types of problems, people, is um, I don't know why I just called you people. That was weird. The, the, reason, the really nice thing about all these problems is that... Um, there isn't a lot of variation, right? They give you an amount of CO2, they give you amount of water, and you go through the exact same process every time. Questions about this? How'd you know that it was 14 moles? 14 grams of moles again? Uh, I just added it up. Carbon's 12, each hydrogen is, is one. Oh, I see. Other questions? Okay. Well, that's um, that's all I've got. I'm happy to go back and do the one problem we skipped if people want to. If you guys don't have other plans, we can just do it. Let's do it. Okay. How many liters of NH3 at this temperature and pressure are required to heat 32 grams of oxygen according to this, or sorry, react 32 grams of oxygen according to this equation? Okay, what's the giveaway that I need to use the equation? Well, they give me information in, of oxygen and they ask for information about NH3. So that means I've got to switch somehow and I can only, I'm gonna switch using the equation which means I need to get this into moles. Now, at the end of the day, I'm going to need liters of NH3. But if they want liters, or they give me pressure, they give me temperature, they want liters. So if I can find moles, I can use the ideal gas law. Okay, well, what does this equation give me? It gives me moles. Okay, so I'm going to take my 32 grams of oxygen. And I'm going to get it into moles so I can use the equation. Equation tells me five moles of O2 requires four moles of NH3. I don't know why I made the line so long. That tells me I'm going to need 0.8 moles of NH3 to react all of my 32 grams of oxygen. Yeah, but they don't ask for moles of NH3, they ask for liters of NH3. But now I have moles, I have temperature, and I have pressure, so I can use the ideal gas law to get volume. And I get 14.7 liters of NH3. But again, the key here is if I want to switch worlds, I've got to get to moles and then I can use the equation. And there's different ways to get to moles, right? I can use ideal gas law. I can use the molar mass. There's different ways, but I've got to get to moles. And this last guy, 
trying to find the mass percent of lead in each of these. Let's just do this one. The mass percent will be the mass of lead over the total mass. So here I've got two leads. So the mass of lead is two times the molar mass of lead. And the total mass is gonna be two leads plus two chlorines plus a carbon plus three oxygens. And that gives me 76% lead. Okay, that's what I've got for you. Feel free to stick around and ask questions. Um, but if not, have a good night, guys. Thank you, Thanks, Jeremy. Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. This will be posted with other YouTube videos. Jeremy, is there any way that you could go over the solubility in water problem one more time? Yeah, That was sure. the only one that I didn't super get. Sorry, if no one else has. Oh, you're good. You, oh, spoke, up. Good. you spoke up first. Hey, Jeremy, so is all the questions going to be a multiple choice, no free response? Yeah, that, I believe that's the case. And did you just say that you're going to post this video on your YouTube channel? Yeah. I, okay. Assuming it's still recording, which I think it is. All right. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to figure out which of these um, dissolves the best. Well, things dissolve in other things that have similar intermolecular forces. So um, water is hydrogen bonding, which is dipole dipole. So things that are polar dissolve well in water. So if I look at this, if I were to just assign intermolecular forces, this thing has that oxygen on there, which is gonna make it dipole dipole. This is a metal and a non-metal, which makes it ionic. These have OHs, which is gonna make it hydrogen bonding. And this is a metal and a non-metal, which is gonna make it ionic. Okay, so if, if I were to rank my intermolecular forces, ion ion, ion dipole, hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole. Things that are closest to this hydrogen bonding are going to dissolve best in water. Okay. This is hydrogen bonding, so that's gonna dissolve the best. So we put that four because they asked for increasing solubility. So four is the best. Okay, well, hydrogen bonding and dipole, dipole are very close. So that means this thing's gonna be next. And now I've got two what ion. What is the dipole on that? This is this bent molecule. If it's got an oxygen and a bunch of carbons, it's probably polar. Okay. Because, because the geometry around oxygens, because they have two lone pairs on them, is always bent. So it's never balanced out. Okay. okay. Yeah. So then now I've got these two ion ions that I've got to compare. And again, because ion ion is stronger than hydrogen bonding, I want weak ion ions. Those are gonna dissolve best. Okay. okay. Now ion ion strength is based off of charge. Higher charges make it stronger and then smaller size makes it stronger. So I want the opposite of this. I want the weaker one. So I can look at these and assign my charges off the periodic table. Two plus one minus, one plus one minus. This tells me this is a stronger ion ion, which means this will be more soluble. It's being held together loose, not as tight. Okay, that makes sense. I just didn't get that it was like, I was just breaking them in terms of like increasing molecular force but it's not it's it's not what's it's closest to water. exactly I exactly see. i get it so if okay. we asked if we said list the things in that are most soluble in like pentane well this is non-polar this has london dispersion so i would want other things that are non-polar those would be soluble in, pe in pentane okay okay i get it thank you yep
I was just going to ask, um, for this problem, if there was a London dispersion, where would it fall in the, like, order? So probably be- last, um, but they're not going to ask you that. Okay, thanks. They might, they could ask you to compare, like, hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole to London dispersion, but they want to ask you to, like, ionic and London dispersion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you send out the answers to this, um, to, these, to this problem set that you just... Yeah, I can just save it as a PDF. What I'll do is I'll save it as a PDF, and then I'll put it in the description of the video. Okay, That perfect. way everybody can get it. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Anything else? Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Oh, a quick question about hydrogen bonding. It's like a sandwich almost. Yep. Where yep. you have a, a fun, like fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, another fun, hydrogen, fun, hydrogen. Yep. It's a hydrogen sandwich. And so. I, I keep coming back to the CH3, OCH3. I just, just really yep. okay, not doing good things with yep. my brain. But that one can't meet the sandwich requirement, right? Not on its own. But if it had a water with it, it could. Wait, so what do you mean if I had a water with it? Like we... Yeah, so, so if I have this, um, so I'll just draw it as CH3. CH3. Does that make sense if I draw it that way? Yeah. Okay. So if I had a water, okay, this is polar. It's got a negative on it. And let me show why it's polar. So it's a bent molecule. That makes sense, right? right. Well, this CH bond has a, is polar, and this CH bond is polar. And because it's bent, those don't balance each other out. And so this has a slight negative on top. And each of these has a slight positive down here. Okay, so that's why this on its own by itself is dipole-dipole. Because if I had two of these, this is polar, another one would be polar, so dipole-dipole. Okay, but now if I were to mix it with water, well, this is negative, this is positive. And now I have my OH in molecule one and my O in molecule two which is what I need for a hydrogen bond. So by itself, it won't have any hydrogen bonding. Yeah, that's why we said this is dipole-dipole. But it, it dissolves really well in water because when it mixes with water, it can make hydrogen bonds, which is what water wants. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, good. Hey, Jeremy? Yep. Aren't there only three elements that can bond with hydrogen? So I'm going to rephrase your question. So there are three elements that can form hydrogen bonds. Okay. So, can you remind me real quick what the three are? It's F, O, and N, because it's fun. Okay. So if I want a hydrogen bond, I need molecule one, to have an FH, OH, or NH covalent bond. Okay. And then I need molecule two to have an F, an O, or an N. And that's kind of what we're showing here. This molecule has an OH covalent bond. This molecule has an O. And so we get this dotted line, which represents the hydrogen bond, the intermolecular attraction. Gotcha. Also, could you just tell us the order of the forces from the strongest to the yeah. weakest? I can just pull it up right here. There. Or did you already draw that? This, these are in order of strongest to weakest. So ion, 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 dipole, hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, dipole induced, London dispersion. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Uh huh. Can you go over um, the mole fraction of H2 problem one more time? This one. Um, yes, that one. Okay. So 
I'm going to move all of this stuff so that I can write again. Or do you just want me to walk you through what I've already written? Can you just like write it out again and everything? Uh -huh. Sorry. That's fine. I get paid by the hour. Didn't mean to draw that line. Okay. So first question, what's the mole fraction of H2? Well, mole fraction is just, of all my moles, what percent of them is hydrogen? I know that my is's and r's don't make sense, but that's okay. So my mole fraction of H2 is gonna be the moles of H2 divided by the total moles. So I've gotta find both of these values, the moles of H2 and the total moles. Well, I have the grams of each thing, so I just gotta change the grams to moles, and that's just a molar mass issue. So my seven grams of nitrogen, one mole of nitrogen is 14 grams, nope, 28 grams, which is gonna be 0 0.25 moles of nitrogen. My two grams of hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen is two grams. So that gives me one mole of hydrogen and 16 grams of CH4. So that gives me one mole of CH4. So I have my moles of hydrogen and my total moles is all of these added up. So 2.25. Well, now if I want the mole fraction of hydrogen, it's the moles of hydrogen divided by total moles. Just what percent of my total moles are hydrogen? So that means the mole fraction of hydrogen equals one mole, because I have one mole of hydrogen over 2.25, which gives me the 0 0.44. So that's the first part. I found the mole fraction of hydrogen. So now before we move on, let's just talk about what partial pressure is. A partial pressure the idea that um, of like in any space you have a certain amount of pressure and that pressure comes from the molecules in the gas phase and so if you have different molecules in the gas phase each of them exerts a certain part of the pressure so if the pressure in my apartment is um, 10 atmospheres then I'm in trouble but just bear with me if the pressure in my apartment is 10 atmospheres and 30% of the, of the particles floating around are oxygen, then 30% of the pressure will be coming from oxygen. Right. And so then we would say my 10 atmospheres times my 30% gives me three atmospheres. In other words, the partial pressure of oxygen is equal to the mole fraction of oxygen times the total pressure. Okay. Okay. So we have the mole fraction. We're talking about hydrogen. Obviously, these numbers are not part of the problem. But my partial pressure of A is going to equal my mole fraction of A times my total pressure. That's an important idea. So I have my partial pressure of H2, or I have my mole fraction of H2. I'm looking for the partial pressure of H2. So one way to do that is to calculate the total pressure and multiply. Okay. Well, to find Sorry, the total... Sorry, you just cut out there. You're good. So one way to calculate this is to take my mole fraction and multiply it by the total pressure. Okay. So because they give me volume and temperature and I have moles, the total moles, I can find the total pressure. Right. So that's going to be my 2.25 moles times my ideal gas constant times my temperature divided by my volume. which is 10.82 atmospheres. That's my total pressure. So then I would say, well, then my pressure of H2 equals my mole fraction of H2 times my total pressure, which is 0 0.444 times 10.82 atmospheres. 
which gives me the pressure of H2 is 4.8 atmospheres. So that's one way you can solve it using this idea of partial pressure. Okay. The other way is to say, well, I know that if I put in my total moles, I get my total pressure, but if I put in my moles of H2, I just get my pressure of H2, which is my partial pressure. So instead of putting 2.25 here, I'm just gonna put my one mole. Mm -hmm. And then I do everything else. And that gives me point three three six seven three 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 five gives me four point eight atmospheres. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I explained that a lot better the second time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's normal. Yeah, that helps a lot. Okay. Good. <laughs>